Our next speaker is a rapper who is also an academic. He holds degrees, has some knowledge of science, and uh, has created a suite of educative raps that will dazzle you with their complex rhymes. The real question is why do most humans believe in a higher power? And what are these beliefs good for? I bring out Baba Brinkman to help us with some answers. Thank you, Moses. How are you, Baba? So I'm sure you could have told that I was a rap artist just by one glance at me, of course. Um, I, I turned my attention to this subject recently, evolutionary religious studies, and they've got some interesting findings. Uh, almost everyone who's religious today believes in a supernatural monitor God that has an interest in morality. God will punish or reward you after you die, and that also applies to the concept of karma. So most people who are religious in some sense believe that, but what they found that was interesting is that most hunter-gatherer societies don't believe that. Hunter-gatherer gods are mostly amoral. They want you to sacrifice to them. There's rituals, there's rules, but if you hurt someone else, pff, that's between y'all. Work it out. The gods don't get involved in morality, and they're local gods. They're not the gods of the universe. They're the gods of the tribe. The next tribe's got their own gods. So how do you work out this puzzle about contemporary religions being different from what we assume are similar to ancestral religions? Well, they think it was cultural group selection. Groups came into conflict with each other. At first, they had very random kinds of beliefs. It didn't matter what you believed, as long as everybody in the tribe believed the same thing. But then a certain kind of belief gained an edge. It was the belief that you are being watched. When you are alone, you will not get away with bad behavior. Most religions today have that belief, and it's probably because it was adaptive. It, in, it incentivized cooperation, right? And if that's really the reason that most people today believe in supernatural monitors, but people prior to 10,000 years ago never did, that would make a prediction that we can use to test this theory. Religious people today should be deeply mistrusting of atheists such as Richard, and such as myself, and many others. Mistrusting. They shouldn't think that atheists are weird or creepy or gross. Uh, they should think that they're untrustworthy. So how can we test this? We can test it with conjunction errors. There's ingenious psychology experiments that can get at the basis of our emotional responses to different kinds of people. So we'll start with a different one. We'll leave mistrust aside, and let's start with sexism. So this is, this is Sean. Sean is, of course, a sexist bastard. All he watches is porn, all he reads is Hustler, the guy hates feminists, he thinks that Girls Gone Wild deserves an Emmy. So knowing that about him, uh, what do you think is more likely to be true of Sean? A, he's a construction worker, or B, he's a construction worker who listens to rap music. Now, one of those two options must be more probable than the other, and I want to put it to a vote. All right? You don't know much about the guy, but you can guess, so put your hand up if you think A is right. He's a construction worker. All right, put your hand up if you think B is right. He's a construction worker who listens to rap. Notice how B wins by a landslide, like 70 to 30, even though B is logically impossible. It can't be B. We got two groups here, people who like rap and construction workers, but that's not what we're comparing. We're comparing construction workers who like rap, which is the little slice in the middle, to all construction workers, which must include the ones who like rap. See, so this question can actually reveal implicit biases. Everyone who voted for B is prejudiced, not necessarily against a group of people, but definitely against a genre of music, which is known as rap music. Congratulations on coming out of the closet today on that feeling. Because voting for B is basically like putting forward the theory that an otherwise neutral person who listens to rap will become more sexist as a causal outcome. Instead of becoming more likely to, I don't know, write rap songs about evolutionary religious studies to feed his wife and daughter or something like that. Anyway, interesting theory. All right, let's try a different one. Uh, this is Kevin. Kevin was out driving the other day and he accidentally crashed into somebody's car, but his car was fine. Big dent in the other guy's door, but there was no one around at the time. So he didn't bother leaving a note or taking down the license plate. He just pff, drove away. Later, he found a wallet on the sidewalk, and he took the cash out of the wallet, but then he put the credit cards and the IDs and the rest of the wallet in the nearest garbage can, because there was nobody watching then either, so pff, why not? And so knowing that about Kevin, what do you think is more likely to be true? A, he's a school teacher, <laughs> or B, he's a school teacher who's an atheist. Who would dare vote for B now? 
tempting, isn't it? Now, if you give this question to people around the world, even though everyone in this room knows that B is logically impossible, you can reveal their implicit mistrust of atheists. Implicit, because someone can outwardly say or even outwardly believe, oh yeah, atheists are totally fine. I have lots of atheist friends, you know. But how they answer this question tells you how likely they think atheists are to be untrustworthy. And you can even use the question to compare atheists to other religious groups. You can say, how likely is it that scumbag Kevin is one of these or one of those? So notice that in this group, Jewish people were perceived as being about twice as trustworthy as feminists who were perceived as being about twice as trustworthy as atheists. Now, I don't know where you're going to put a Jewish feminist atheist on this graph, but it does suggest that, you know, the feminist one is kind of surprising, isn't it? Somewhere out there, there's some guy like, nasty feminist dented my car again. I know it. Um, <laughs> But, but um, you can also compare atheists to other religious groups. So notice that in this North American study, Christian was a very unpopular answer. Almost nobody thought it was possible for Kevin to be a Christian, because if he was a Christian, he never would have done that. God was watching him, you know. But what's interesting here is that in post-9-11 America, the Muslims are trusted about four times more than the atheists. Because at least the Muslims believe in something, right? I mean, atheists, atheists are almost unelectable in America. Uh, we don't really talk about politics uh, uh, the, the, the religions of our politicians doesn't come up too much in Canada, but in America it's a huge deal. And um, there's a fourth category you'll notice here. They tried all these groups to see if they could find any group that was trusted less than atheists in this study, and they couldn't find any. But they did find one that came close. This one here is uh, convicted rapists. <laughs> yeah. And that's how they stacked up for mistrust against law-abiding atheists. Now, as a non-believer myself, I did find these results a little unfair. You can picture a couple at home like, so, honey, we're going to the movies tonight. Who should we uh, leave the kids with? Should we go with the convicted rapist or should... No, no, let's, let's go with the rapist because I just don't like that biology guy that's an atheist. You know? it, it does seem to be the emotional undercurrent of the research. But, you know, there's a silver lining here because it turns out... We, there's a lot of differences individually by region. The more religious a place is, the more they mistrust atheists and vice versa. So some global extremes would show you uh, all the countries at the top are the ones in which atheism is currently punishable by death under the law. Uh, but when they give that same test in Scandinavia, they find almost no mistrust of atheists and every other country is somewhere in between. But they find that our beliefs are very malleable. If you show people pictures like these photos here, it changes their beliefs. Cops, um, parliaments, court systems, CCTV, if you remind them that we have civic uh, technologies that are enforcing morality, their beliefs will change. They will profess greater certainty in atheists, and they will profess, or not certainty, greater trust in atheists, and they will profess lower certainty in their own religious beliefs, which means these photos make people less religious. So I'm just going to leave them on the screen for a minute. <laughs> Now, you gotta, you, I mean, I, this makes me more sympathetic to religion, personally, as a non-believer, because, you know, there really was a time in history when you needed a religion. You needed a religion to find a community. How else did you find a community of like-minded people that you could share ideas with? Or, or what about finding a ride home from church? Who can you trust to drive you home if not someone from your church? Or, or what about finding a mate? Who are you going to reproduce with if not someone from your church? Or, or maybe finding a place to stay in a foreign city? Or finding someone that you can trust to buy stuff from and sell stuff to? Now, all these peer-to-peer -peer systems, don't get me wrong. They're not going to completely replace religion, but they're taking over a lot of its traditional territory right now. They are doing for us what religion used to do. And what's interesting is they're all designed around hunter-gatherer morality. Recall, hunter-gatherers didn't believe in a supernatural monitor god, nor did they have kings or chiefs or cops enforcing state-based laws on them. They had a couple of things that made the morality function, and those two things are ostracism and gossip. And that's what runs all these systems here as well, right? You got a reputation to maintain, and if your reputation gets bad, you get kicked out of the group. So this was the idea I found in this academic uh, research field, and then I was like, well, I got to write a rap about that. So I'm going to attempt to summarize the history of religious evolution in a three-minute rap song right now. Uh, but to do that, we're going to have to go all the way back to the beginning. We're going tribal, y'all. Right. Tribal religions. There was no cops, there was no states, there, was no, there were no heaven or hell. So how were they nice to each other? I'll tell you. It's not going to be hard to go tribal, because your ancestors were all hunter-gatherers. Everyone in this room, go back far enough, it was just spears and caves and campfires. 
Religions are devices for coordinating action and keeping people from fragmenting into warring factions. The benefits of sticking together are kind of fragile, and people on their own are like wheels without an axle. So everything we do is communal. That's critical. Any prima donna grandstanding gets ridiculed. All the gods do is visit shamans in their trances and make mischief and disasters and play with us when we're dancing. But they don't punish or reward us in the afterlife. It's dark and boring there. The gods want to sacrifice they want to help us to move and sway to the rhythm and they're pleased whenever we collectively make a decision and those who break with custom get punished with ostracism and gossip the gods don't watch us but somebody's watching so watch it it's life and death out there we need vigilance there's always war parties raiding on our villages anybody shirking a burden to benefit himself at the expense of someone else gets expelled it's been this way since time immemorial all for one one for all that's the warrior code. Ain't nobody messing with my tribalism. Click, click. Come on, put your fingers up like this. The click, yeah. We're gonna be like seaweed all together. Feel that? Yeah. That's the click, click, click. Uh. See, everything we do is communal. Now, Religions are devices for coordinating action and keeping people from fragmenting into warring factions. The benefits of sticking together are kind of fragile, and people on their own are like wheels without an axle. But lately we've been planting some barley and tending cattle. Now we got a stockpile and a standing army for battle. But now it seems like half the people like me to renonymous. The honor system is breaking down. There's something wrong with us. 10,000 people in a city-state metropolis? Now we've got a sky god looking down watching us supernatural monitors keep the people in line they don't only see your actions they can see into your mind and after you die the gods will judge you and face you and either raise you into their presence or curse you and disgrace you and punish you in this life too with ill fortune because nothing gets them shaken like the fear of hell scorching because ain't nobody messing with my true believer click put them up click 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 see the rest of us are counting on you to act right so don't be a don't be a now believers can establish new trade routes. Bonds of mutual trust benefit the faithful. Anonymous strangers say the words and exchange favors. Make wagers on common causes and face dangers. But no one trusts you if you don't perform the rituals and make habitual sacrifices at frequent intervals. Public demonstrations, the more wasteful the better. Costly sacrifices so people can take your measure and believe you believe so the trust can continue. And when the bonds are cemented, we'll form an insular in group and members of the out group are less human and when they transgress we're less prone to excuse them cooperation has a dark side lurking religious wars are just religions working we climb the ladder of society with big gods but lately we've made up some other ways people can get watched we climb the ladder of society with big gods now we've got some other ways people can get watched and that's the punishment the gods above are loving it the system's organized to get to you and who you running with nowadays we rely on the government but once upon a time it was supernatural punishment because ain't nobody messing with my secular click 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 we respect authorities as long as they're civic ick <laughs> ick yeah thank you Holy cow. Thank you. Bravo. In the dead of night, preparing for this, I remembered, though I feel a little shy now, but I remember I once did a rap. Will you share it with w us now? Would you care to see it? Absolutely, yes. I come to talk to you today not knowing what I have to say because our subject's so obtuse, it provides me with a good excuse to demand that Bruce, who laid it down, explain why I should play the clown, risk laying egg just to find out what living literacies are all about. So it's time to start, ready, aim, fire. The academics are here, so is the choir. My purpose is to explicate. Multimedia today makes man literate. 
Avoid confusion, there's no illusion. Remember process, not conclusion. Step right up, place your bets. Pictures everybody gets. But illiteracy comes from printed words, just like virtue comes from birds. Academics and the high arts, too, have turned their backs on me and you. Instant consensus instantly changed. Remember, television is not a problem to be managed, but an instrument to be played. You were the inspiration, Baba. That was a great I, performance. I salute the run DMC of academic hip hop, <laughs> Moses. <laughs> <laughs> I must document it.